I could hear the hesitation with the last name. <laughs> I have, my parents are hippies, so they made up my first name, so there's about seven of us out in the world. Uh, so it's always interesting when people try to say either one of my names. <laughs> uh, so today, uh, good morning, everybody. Hope you guys have coffees, Red Bull, Bloody Marys, whatever. Um, uh, I'm gonna be talking today about 3D printing, Ruby and solar panels, which is kind of like all the buzzwords. Um, so a little bit about me. My name is Ramika Gayhart. Uh, I usually go by Mika. You can find me on Twitter at CC and UC. It's, uh, uh, if anybody wonders, it's actually from a really old, really cheesy blog I had in high school. Uh, I'm a programmer. I work at Quick Left, which is a consultancy. Our main office uh, that I work at is in Boulder, but we also have offices in Portland and San Francisco. And I learned to be a programmer uh, from the people at the Turing School of Software and Design. Uh, but my old job, before I was a professional nerd, I was in the solar field. And we did commercial and residential <coughs> solar installations. Uh, we used a program called SketchUp to do drawings like these. So I'm going to be touching a little bit on my past life to give this talk. So um, this is Im always important. What's the plan? What am I going to talk about? Um, first, I'm going to start with the obvious one, which is, Mike's a little hot. Uh, what is SketchUp? Then using SketchUp BP, which stands for Before Programming. Uh, so this is how I use SketchUp uh, before I was a programmer, and I knew the magic of computers. Then I want to talk about, because this is a Ruby conference, SketchUp and Ruby and how they work together. <laughs> Then uh, I want to talk about using SketchUp AP, which is after programming, so ways that I could have used Ruby to do my job a little bit better. And finally, for those of you who don't do industrial construction, it's cool, I don't do industrial construction anymore, uh, I want to talk about SketchUp and 3D printing, which is a way that uh, we can all use SketchUp every day if we want to. So what is SketchUp? Uh, primarily, SketchUp is a 3D modeling computer program. It was based in architectural design, and that's where its roots are. It's a desktop application. It works in uh, OS and Windows systems. And it was formerly Google SketchUp. So it started as a startup in Boulder and then was acquired by Google and now is owned by Trimble, which is actually kind of a cool navigation because Google put a lot of work and love and Googliness into it. And then it went off to Trimble, which is a big <coughs> scale. Uh, it's kind of like project management. They do a ton of stuff, navigation, stuff like that. Um, but I'll talk more about the Google part later. So um, SketchUp was designed originally to be an architectural program. Um, it was designed to be user friendly. It was designed for architects and designers. So if you notice, like the buttons are really easy to, like if you look at them, you kind of can figure out what they do. It's a really pretty interface. Like you can kind of think of it as like the Ruby Mine or the Sublime Text versus AutoCAD, Vim, or Emacs. So why is SketchUp great? Uh, it's free. It's completely free for non-commercial use. And the pro version is only, I think, about $590, which is really cheap for our 3D rendering program. It's super easy to use. It has an open source and programmable component, which is rare for a desktop application. Um, and I'm going to talk about that more also. Uh, it's a great onboarding platform for learning 3D design. 3D design is like a real mind bender. It's like the first time that you get into CSS and you're like, what is the index? I learned like two days ago, which is really sad. Um, and then Google Earth integration is, to me, the biggest cool thing about SketchUp. Uh, so if you have seen like the Google Earth, the buildings in Google Earth, those are all done in SketchUp. So I like to think of SketchUp as kind of like the first drill you buy before that happens to your garage. So why did we use SketchUp for solar installations? Um, we provided visuals for clients, scale estimates. We used the geolocation, the shadows, less words, more show, right? It's a conference. So I wanted to take you guys through a walkthrough on my typical day um, when, I would, uh, when I did work in solar. So the, this is the before programming part. So let's say I'm like sitting in my office. I get a call from a coffee shop. Um, and they are interested in doing solar. But they want to know how much it's going to cost, how much energy they can offset. They want to know a little bit more before they drop $60,000 in solar. My coworker told me to like drink between every slide, which I was like, there's like 200 slides in here. It's going to be like, the, like a Norm MacDonald skit. Um, 
So, uh, so I get this call from the coffee shop, right? I want to get solar on the roof. I'm going to send a guy out, but I don't want to send him out cold, right? Um, I want to get an idea of what's going on. So I get the guy's address for the coffee shop. I've been there. I've gotten coffee there. I've never been on the roof, right? But we can work around that. So we're going to open up SketchUp. I'm going to choose a template. Um, the first, the template that I'm going to use is the simple template, feet and inches. Normally, we would be working in millimeters um, and not feet and inches because no one else uses feet and inches. But I started doing the demo in feet and inches, and then I didn't want to go back. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to pull down. So SketchUp is open. We're going to pull down this thing called geolocation and add location. So this is where the Google integration comes in. It's going to pop up a Google Earth interface. We're going to put in the address. Um, this is my favorite coffee shop, Rooster and, uh, Rooster and Moon in Denver. Once we type in the address, we're going to actually see it, kind of like if you were getting directions. We're going to circle the area that we kind of want to work with around the building, hit that grab button, and it's automatically dropped into this 3D workspace. And it is perfectly to scale, or at least as to scale as Google Earth has it, which is usually fairly accurate. So the first step, we're going to want to go 2D. Um, we're going to trace the outline of the building with lines. Um, you can see there's, uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know if this guy has, no. Um, you can see that there's uh, little lines here. And then you see that dotted line? Uh, SketchUp does like uh, matching. So if you've got one line up here, and you're drawing a line down here, it's going to let you know when you're at that point, kind of like PowerPoint or something like that. But it's super helpful. Once you've connected all the lines, SketchUp's going to automatically create a face for you. And the first thing that you're going to think is like, oh, let's make it into a little 3D building. But before you go 3D, you want to stay in 2D land and think about the question, what's on the roof? Because if you notice, there's a number of things that look probably like their HVAC units, maybe their air conditioning. Um, they're probably not going to want to get rid of their air conditioning for solar. Like, they want to go green, but not that green. So, <laughs> so we're going to have to work around that when we do the design. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is, um, again, SketchUp is to scale. So when we do actually send somebody out there, if the client's really interested, we're going to get like exact measurements. We're going to measure runs and height. But to estimate, we're just going to basically draw them out. So we've drawn out our little boxes, and now we're ready to go 3D. So we're going to use a tool called Push-Pull. And the reason I'm pointing this out is we're going to do it later with code. Um, so we're going to grab this push-pull tool, and what you can basically do is grab the tops of all of the little HVAC units. Say we're assuming that the building is like 20 feet tall, and the HVAC units are, we'll assume the building's 17 feet tall. We'll assume the HVAC units are 3 feet tall. So we'll pull the HVAC units up 20 feet, pull the building up 17. And um, that kind of begs the question, why does height matter? And the reason that it matters is shading. Shading on solar panels equals a loss of productivity. So there's a lot of things to this, and I should throw out the announcement. I am super not an electrician. Uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, to kind of go over it, uh, with solar panels, um, any amount of shading, even if it's a tiny amount, is going to cut down on productivity. So solar's very expensive. Panels are extremely expensive. Wire runs are expensive. So it's constantly a balancing act of if you're offsetting enough power to pay for what you front loaded in cost for a solar installation. Um, so loss of productivity from that point is really important. Most grants that people do to offset solar depend on having a certain percentage of lack of shading during prime time hours. Uh, so that's another concern. The other thought is these are usually lined up like Christmas lights, so they're on strings. Um, so they all go into like there's a one inverter for a pile of solar panels. And if they're all coming in at different power levels, that's going to wreak havoc on the inverters. And you're going to have to be at a point where you're buying micro inverters, which is like an individual one. The whole point of solar is that you don't get on the roof and do maintenance more than once a decade. But when you have a tiny inverter per panel, then you've got to get some dude up there every year fixing something. Um, so shading is a big deal. And Believe me, after you work in solar, every single time you see a solar installation with like a tree next to it, you're like, no, <laughs> you were robbed. So uh, like I said, uh, if you remember, we inputted the address. So we have lat long information. And since there is a Google tie-in, there's actually shadow calculations specific to the area that we're in. So if we go into the shadow box, and we can toggle between any day, any time of year, any time of day. There are, there's a window of time and there's a window of the calendar year that matter for solar. Like November, December, you don't really care about. And I'm speaking of the like Eastern United States, there are different rules for different locations, but that's where I worked. So uh, with SketchUp, you can look from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., which is really cool. 
So the last step in finishing the roof is just a little one, but it's super important. We're gonna use this thing called the push-pull tool, which is awesome. So you're on a face, you hit the push-pull tool, you type in three, and it makes this border <coughs> for three feet. And the reason that you do that in the solar world is that you usually have like lips or drainage that you wanna avoid on the sides of the roof. There's usually zoning issues around putting solar out there. Three feet's usually a safe bet until you've actually talked to a zoning official. Because solar is relatively new, every single zoning official has different rules. It's a huge pain. And now our building is ready and I'll take a sip of water. So, uh, the first thing, uh, now the building's ready, we wanna add some panels. Um, there is a Trimble 3D warehouse. There's a warehouse that's attached to solar, or to SketchUp. So there's a button within the program that uh, goes out to the internet and gives you this, uh, which is access to models that people have designed to use specifically in SketchUp, and it's huge. So if you search solar panel, you're gonna find one. A lot of companies actually upload their specific models, like to scale and um, with like specific, like what they actually look like, which is, I think the logic is that if they have them up there, then people use them and then they'll install them, which isn't really the case, but it's super awesome that they're up there. So we're gonna grab this model, which is a solar panel GE Energy GE PVP 200. I've never seen that before. And we're gonna add it onto the roof. So I don't know if you can kind of tell from this picture, but it kind of gets dropped in at random. And it's at a tilt, and it's definitely at the wrong orientation. So we're gonna use a tool called Rotate, and we're going to get the panel flat so that we can work with it. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to actually connect it to the existing structure. So we're gonna actually like lock it onto the side of the building that we wanna get it level with, and then we're gonna use the rotate tool to get it flat. I feel like Bob Vila right now, this is great. Uh, <laughs> then we're gonna use the rotate tool again, and we're gonna orient it south. So again, I'm designing, uh, I have experience working in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, et cetera. Um, so I am automatically orienting the panels south, because that's the way you kinda wanna go. There's like a whole science to exactly how south you wanna get, depending on your orientation, and I don't know it. But uh, that's why you have like a master electrician that works with you. But, um, but generally speaking, if your building is mostly it, towards the orientation that you want to go, you're going to follow the lines of the building because it costs a lot less to lose a little bit of optimization than to like measure everything out and try to get everything perfectly <coughs> south and then it looks really weird on the roof. So place the panel on the side along the border. And we're gonna use the copy pasta. There's a move uh, duplicate tool in SketchUp. Add one inch between the panels. That's like a typical racking system is about one inch. What's cool about SketchUp is that once you do this like move and you add an inch, it remembers specific to the component. So the next time you add another panel, it's gonna remember that other inch, which is kind of a cool programming thing. Which once I got into like actually programming SketchUp, I was like, that's super hard. That's awesome. Um, we're also gonna put a tilt on the projector. Uh, we're gonna put a tilt on the panel. So there's a lot of reasons that you don't want a panel flat on the roof. Uh, the first one is um, it's kind of a little bit strange. I didn't know this at first, but heat uh, slows down electricity. So if you've got a panel directly on the roof, there's no airflow underneath it, and it's gonna slow down the electricity. So that's why you usually see them um, pushed up a little bit. There's usually at least like an inch of space, even if they look like they're flush with the roof. Uh, the second reason is that solar panels are meant to, um, they're meant to like slough off snow, rain, they're meant to be, you don't have to do anything with them, right? But if you put them flat, uh, we actually did this at Hershey, Pennsylvania, um, we had this like, they wanted them flat, and the problem is that um, when it rains, the water evaporates, and then it leaves a residue. And if they're at an angle, they'll wash that residue off naturally with the next rain. If they're not, it just builds up. And then like every month you gotta get like some dude up on your like canopy, you're just like hosing it down. It's super inefficient. Um, so uh, the amount of tilt is also a science, um, but for like an estimate, we would typically go like 30, 30 degrees and go with that. So uh, SketchUp has this concept of components and groups. So a component is basically like a clone. Each panel is a component. Uh, if you make a change to one component, it changes all the components. So if you change the color, it's gonna change all the panels. A group is more like putting everything together for ease of use. And everything is made up of these like little lines and faces and dots, but usually you don't have to go down to that level. You just make components and groups. So if we make this panel into a group, we can actually rotate it all at once. We can copy it, and we can fill up the roof with panels. 
And we can go a little bit too far because much like Vim, uh, as you do like a copy action, you can type in a number of times and if you haven't counted very well because you're not great at math, you end up with one little guy floating off. Uh, so as you notice, the next step, uh, there's a lot of panels that are literally in HPSC units, which isn't going to work out super well. So you can explode the groups and start deleting panels that are obviously going to be an issue. Once you've got that, then it's time to use your shading tool. So you can start looking at the times that you want to look at. You want to get a rough idea of the shading and you're going to delete the panels that are obviously going to be in shade. And then the final step is to optimize. So if you notice like back here, there's some panels that are kind of floating off by themselves. There's some that are like way down there. Um, one thing to think about with solar is the cost of the run because the wire costs money. So the farther you're going with solar, the more expensive it is. If you've got one little dinky panel floating off by itself, it's usually not worth it. The other issue is that um, you, knew, you have to like circuit, like line them up in circuits. So normally you can't have one off by itself. The further it is from the other one, the more difference in electrical input you're usually getting. So you typically want to be a little, like we're probably going to be able to fit more on this roof when we actually get out there, but much like with software development, you want to give something to the client that's an MVP first instead of being like, we can offset all your energy, just kidding. So at this point, I have no idea how many components are in there. I'm not great at counting. So since they are components, I can actually go to Entity Info and find out exactly how many are in the model. And now I have something that I can actually give to the client. Um, so when I did this, I started, I started the company as a secretary and then started doing design. And then um, we ended up getting an intern from like an AutoCAD school. And he like, this would take me like, I don't know, three or four hours, depending on how long. He like crushed me, so, <laughs> so I ended up like backing off doing project management, getting out of construction, I went to Turing, and now I'm here. And, um, and that was great, but if I'd only known the Ruby that I know now, I could have totally crushed that intern, just crushed him. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is that the SketchUp team, even though this is a desktop application, they've provided a Ruby interface, and it seems like it's like their child, like they love this thing. Um, so one of the ways that you can hack into the Ruby interface, they've actually provided a Ruby console within SketchUp, which is kind of like IRB. Uh, it's got some limitations. You can't like have enter, like you can't enter. It's a little weird, but uh, it's, it's loaded with the SketchUp API preset, so it's pretty cool that it's actually in the desktop. So every time that you pull up that like simple template, there's usually like a 3D character. It always changes. When I started, it was like a lady, and now it's like this dude. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's in every model, and as a Rubyist, let's say I want to find out what's going on with this guy. Um, so within my console, I can grab SketchUp.ActiveModel and get the whole uh, active model that I'm working with. On the active model, I can call entities.count, see how many things are in there. We've just opened it, so it's only one. I can grab that one entity and call class on it and find out that this dude is a component instance, so he's kind of like a panel. Since he's a component instance, I can call description and I can find out that this is Paul Stevenson Oles, an architect and co-founder of the American Society of Architectural Illustrators. He enjoys long walks, working out, <laughs> etc. And unfortunately, I can also programmatically erase him. <laughs> so. Let's get into using SketchUp after programming. How could I have used SketchUp to do my job better if I knew Ruby? So the SketchUp Ruby API lists uh, four different things that they, uh, reasons that you'd want to use the API. So I'm going to kind of touch on each one of those. And the first one would be create custom drawing tools. So if you remember, I had this panel that I dropped in that was already created, but obviously we worked with a couple of different types of panels. So what if I want to make a custom panel every time I'm working? I can actually create a little bit of script that will do that for me. So if I'm creating the script, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put like a little comment in there that basically says where I've got it, because that's what I'm going to put into the Ruby console when I want to call the script. I'm going to create a class that's solar module, and I'm going to initialize it with the basic like, defaults that I need to know about a panel. I'm going to start with like width, length, and thickness, throw in some <coughs> defaults, 24, 12, and 1. These are in inches. Um, I'm going to give it a name so that I can find that panel at some point. You can search by the name of the, pan the component. 
I'm going to give it like a panel color so you can put in like hex codes, you can put in words and it'll uh, map to like a material color in SketchUp. And then I'm going to put in a start. Uh, so this is going to be the first point, the starting point of the first panel. And that geom point 3D new is like the first SketchUp specific thing that we're seeing. And that is representing the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the first panel. And the Z coordinate, I have it pushed up a little bit because if it's actually flat, it's like a little bit weird. So. And then finally, we're going to do set a panel definition to nil for the default because a uh, component instance is like one panel. The component definition is the recipe for making panels. So when we draw the first, this maybe isn't the best Ruby, but it, when we draw the first one, we're going to set this panel definition and then uh, we can use it from then on. So we're going to expose one method out there, um, not a private method. And what it's basically going to say, it's going to be draw. And if there's not a panel definition, we're going to draw a new module. And draw a new module is going to be this guy. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to get that active model like we did uh, when we were finding that guy. We're going to grab and create an entity so that we can push everything. Uh, we're going to create a group so we can push all of our lines and faces into a group. Then we're going to do a panel face. So that's entities.addFace and we're going to call a method face coordinates and get coordinates out of it. And what face coordinates is going to do is it's going to define where we are going to draw our little box to start off the first one. So it's going to take the width, the length, and then the starting point and calculate what the coordinates are. So it's basically going to look like this when it's done. Then we're going to use that push-pull tool, which we, can, we used before in the GUI. We're going to actually programmatically use it, and we're going to push the panel up to the thickness. And finally, we're going to make our group into a component. Uh, we're going to make the group into a component. So this make component is going to give a definition, it's going to give a name, and it's going to set the panel definition and return our instance. And then this is what we got. We got a little white box, which is cool. That took me like <laughs> five weeks. Um, <laughs> so let's at least style the thing, because that's, that's ugly. Uh, so style module, uh, we're going to pass it the original face, and the original face is actually now on the ground. So we have to calculate the opposite face and find that. And so our calculate is, it's a lot harder in code than it is when you're clicking it. Um, we're going to use the object ID and the area to figure out which face is the opposite, because there's actually a lot of faces now. We're going to set like a border offset, so it's going to kind of look like the frame. So we're going to push in the panel and then have like a little frame. And then we're going to color the panel. So we're going to assume that the s largest small panel is going to be blue, and then the rest are going to be silver. This took me, I'm not kidding, this took me five days to like parse. Like I'm just like sitting there at my computer like, what? Which face? Why is it blue on the inside? <laughs> and now, through the wonders of programming, we can now use this. So we jump into our Ruby console, and we load up our file. Uh, we call solar module.new, we can pass it an empty hash, so we use our defaults. And we call draw on that, and there, right there in the bottom, we have a little panel. And we can add weird colors, yellow, black, pass that into a new solar module, and we got a really ugly panel. <laughs> and since we did, I'm not going to touch on it too much, um, but we did have that other instance, so if, it was a, if we didn't have a panel definition, we'd, we'd draw a new one. If we did have a panel definition, we would um, like duplicate it. Um, so now if we hit draw multiple times, if we hit it, we've actually, they're all the same component instead of creating new component definitions every time. So that was creating a custom drawing tool. Whee! Uh, what about automating common tasks? Um, so if we do have a building like this, we probably don't want to be like, okay, I'm going to hop into the console and I'm going to type in and I'm going to remember what I name my file every time and then I'm going to type my measurements. So what we can actually do is create, uh, we can actually program something that's actually in the dropdown of this desktop application that's there for us every time we open SketchUp. So when we made, when I made the, um, the file, I put it in this application support SketchUp file in the plugin directory in its own folder. But if we put something directly in the plugin directory, we put a Ruby file in there, it's going to load automatically every time we open SketchUp. So if we do that, uh, we can create a file. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to require our solar module class. And then this is some pretty interesting. This is SketchUp specific code. So it's going to say, if the module input isn't loaded already, um, we're going to go up and grab that like little tool dropdown. And within there, we're going to add a submanual module input. 
And then we're going to add this um, option that is add solar modules, and that's going to trigger a method module input dialog, and it's going to let us know that it's been loaded. And I hope you guys forgive me for this gigantic method, <laughs> but I'll break it down. Uh, so, module, so what it's going to do is call this module input dialog. So it's going to, now we could try to programmatically figure out which space, so the idea of this is that we want to get a panel, we want to put it on top of the roof at the starting point, and then we want to make a row of it, right? So we could try to figure out which face that exists in the model is a roof. Or we can assume that the user selected it before they've used our tool, which is awesome user interface. But, uh, so we're going to look for SketchUp active model selection and find and make sure that the selection is a face. If nothing has been selected, we're going to pop up a little message box. Please select the face and try again. Otherwise, we're going to pop up a UI web dialog, and this is a SketchUp specific thing, and it's going to pop up a little uh, thing that we can play with. And that thing is going to be reading from this HTML file, and it's going to be showing it. And it's going to have a callback, which connects to the button in our HTML file, which is going to be a form. And when we hit that callback, we're going to call this method generate modules. So this is what it actually looks like. So we've, got, we've actually made a little drop-down tool where we've got a little HTML form that is super not styled. Um, and this is the HTML that generates it. So to point out a few interesting things, um, in SketchUp, you can use CSS, you can use JavaScript. And then down there at that button, the generate button, that's going to be our callback to the generate modules to, to do the next step. So the next step, this add action callback, is going to process the module input dialog. So if you look at the module <coughs> generator, like that's what we're pulling in. And then we're going to like turn that into a hash. So you can parse all the stuff that's coming in from the form like that. We're going to then process the surface data. So we grab that surface that's the roof, and we're going to try to figure out where the starting point is on the roof. And for the northeast, we're going to be looking for the southwest corner to start our row out. So we're going to calculate that, and we're going to calculate that bottom line and how long that is. And we're going to do it like that. And again, it's so much harder in code than it is when you're drawing, for me. Uh, so then we're going to new up a solar module. We're going to input the information that we have about the roof and about what the user inputted for information about the module. And we're going to draw a module. So that's going to drop one little module down. But let's make a row, right? So we're going to populate rows. We're going to add a spacer of one inch. We're going to get the module count and calculate how many we can fit in that space. And then we're going to do this like move copy, which is the SketchUp tool. Um, but that's actually, it's actually a plugin. So there's, like I said, there's a lot of open source on these Ruby files. So this is one that was done by Martin Reinhardt. I'm not going to go into it too deeply, but pretty much anything you want to do in SketchUp, you can find. But you have to kind of search because a lot of the people who are writing Ruby for SketchUp are architects and they're like, what is GitHub? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm putting this in my WordPress site. <laughs> so when we hit generate, bam, we get a row of modules. And they're spaced one inch apart and it's a start. But it is totally not a complete tool, right? Um, so let's talk about building a plugin business and annotating and reporting. These are things that the SketchUp API says that you can do. And building a plugin business sounds a little cheesy, right? Like you're going to write a little bit of Ruby and sell it. But they do have, they have an inherent scrambler. So you can actually like sell your plugins, which is kind of neat. But here's an example of one that we actually did use at my company. Uh, oh, no, that's not an example at all, is it? Uh, <laughs> so these uh, plugin businesses, um, you can get the plugins from, there's a SketchUp extension warehouse, so kind of like the, um, where we got the materials. We can also download plugins, like kind of like a gem farm, basically, within SketchUp. Um, and like I said, there are a lot of architects and non-developers who are writing um, plugins, so you can find them also in places like uh, Smustard, uh, which is a site of like different plugins, and from GitHub, this like gem farm, uh, basically extension warehouse is kind of new. So you can actually just download them and throw them in your file, and that works too. But this is the program that we used to use, and it is a salty $200, and people do pay it <laughs> because it does everything and like a hundred things more than the little program that I wrote. So it does minimal shading, erasing panels, rotating north, restoring north, etc. And you can actually use it to really easily drop in these like arrays of racking and get um, reports back that you can give the client. Um, things that look like this. It's 
super awesome. So uh, you might be thinking, I don't install solar. It's cool. I don't either. Um, so you might want to hop on the new hotness, SketchUp, and 3D printing. So uh, <coughs> cover why people 3D print. Um, Basically, there are a lot of reasons to do it. Um, one that is a major one is rapid prototyping. So if you have an idea for something, you instead of paying to get 100 things manufactured, you can throw one out into the world, find out if it works, and then uh, if it doesn't, don't make it again. Um, also, newer replacement parts. So if you need something that's no longer manufactured, I read an article about a guy who had um, owned apartment buildings where the windows, the, there's one specific piece, and they didn't make it anymore, and so he just 3D printed it and then didn't have to install new windows in his building, which I'm sure his tenants were like super excited about. But <laughs> uh, you can also get things that have never been manufactured before. And finally, you can make your dreams come true, <laughs> no matter how really weird they are. So 3D printing is a, f is a part of SketchUp specifically thanks to Ruby. Um, SketchUp was made as an architectural tool, and that's what it was made for. And it, uh, there's a world of difference between drawing something that you're only ever going to print out on paper versus that you want to print out in a 3D printer, right? So people in the open source community and the SketchUp team themselves open sourced plugins to fill in the gaps to make SketchUp a usable tool for 3D printing. And when I say fill in the gaps, like I literally mean that sometimes. <laughs> so um, I had never 3D printed before. I thought it was kind of cool. So I wanted to do kind of a walkthrough on how it went for me. And in the process, kind of show you some of the open source Ruby tools that I actually used um, that I needed to actually do 3D printing. So when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to 3D print, I wanted to do something to uh, thank my company for paying for me to come out here giving me the time off, letting me not check Slack for a couple of days. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really know like, what I wanted to print, so I was kind of thinking about it. And it turns out we really, like Quick Left, we really like our queue like a lot, like a lot. We love that queue. So I figured queue-shaped cookie cutter, that's the way to go. So this time when we open SketchUp, we're going to start with a 3D printing template. Um, and I'm going to do it in millimeters this time because I thought of it in advance. Uh, I think I'm going to do it in millimeters, we'll see. So <laughs> when you open the template, uh, you're going to get this like little, instead of the little dude, Paul Stevenson, architect, long walks on the beach, you're going to get this uh, representative little bounding box of what a typical 3D printer, actually specifically what a MakerBot Replicator 2X has space for, but it's usually representative of most printers. Um, and I did a little bit of cheating. Um, I didn't want to draw a queue, so <laughs> what I did is I used the SketchUp's uh, 3D text tool. You can import any font, so I imported our font and, um, and made a 3D queue. Boom! Um, but that is not good enough. Got to do more stuff to it, right? Um, the, the thing with uh, 3D printing is materials are really expensive, so the more hollow you can make things, the cheaper they're going to be. Um, and also, it's not going to be a super effective cookie cutter if I'm just like mashing it like as a block. <laughs> So what I had to do was hollow out the queue. So one of the first things that you need to think about is wall thickness and strength. Um, so you want to go hollow, but you don't want to go too hollow. So you can't just have like a flat face. So one millimeter of thickness is usually, I think, the smallest you can kind of go with plastics. So that's as small as I went for my first uh, V1. So the first plugin that I used that was pretty crucial is this Cleanup 3. Uh, it's a free plugin that's out there. You can find it in the extension warehouse. And uh, it, went, it goes for the concept of no stray lines. So this is a little faked, the, thing, the little curly guy I got in the corner. But there are usually a lot of stray lines that make their way into any drawing. They're just like floating off there. And 3D printers aren't super smart. So if you give them a line, they're going to try to print it. And they can't print that. That has no actual uh, width to it. So you use the 3D up, uh, the cleanup. Uh, blah. <laughs> you use the plugin, hit clean, and it gives you this really cool user interface, which is a lot prettier than the one that I made. Um, a little shown up right now. And then it gives you, uh, once you clean up, it gives you an idea of how many edges will reduce, faces, purged layers, purged materials, which is really cool. The next one uh, that I used was the Solid Inspector plugin. Again, this is another free plugin that's out there. Um, another concept is that you want your models to be solid. 
And that's basically like watertight. So they need to be connected. They need to not have tiny holes in them. And for the queue, it's not as hard to figure out. But as you're drawing something more and more complicated, there's more and more opportunities for like little holes or faces to sneak in. So when we use the solid inspector, what it does is it kind of like, it, it looks really cool. It looks like a bullseye. But it uh, targets areas that they thinks may be problematic, where there are like duplicate faces that you don't need, stuff like that. And then you can go in and kind of clean them up and make sure everything is printable. And the most important um, <coughs> plugin that I used was this STL file formatting plugin. This is actually made by the SketchUp team, but they have open sourced it. It's on GitHub. And um, most files, I think most 3D printing, you kind of need, there's a couple of different file formats, but I think the major one is STL. So if you exported just a typical SketchUp file, you wouldn't be able to 3D print it very easily. But the STL file format, you can send anywhere. And um, you can also now import STL files. So somebody drew something in AutoCAD, you can import it into SketchUp, and you don't have to pay for AutoCAD. It's awesome. So uh, I did not buy a 3D printer. But I did use online printing services. So I used Shapeways and iMaterialize, which are, I think the two big ones. Uh, the pros in using an online printing service is print material selection. So this is like a screenshot of Shapeways, and there's hundreds of more materials. But you can do pla like many different plastics, full color sandstone, ceramics, uh, precious metals. So all of those materials you can get really easily from online printing and see which one is the right one for you before you purchase you know, one type of plastic. Uh, there's a quality assurance. So as soon as you upload a model to either online printing service that I used, they provided you, like, if I wanted to print my queue in stainless steel, the walls weren't quite thick enough. So they target problem areas that they think might be issues. And then when you send in your design, um, they are going to prove it before they take your money. So uh, it's basically on them to make sure that it prints correctly. And anybody who has 3D printed at home probably could speak at length about how many things can go wrong while you're printing. <laughs> Uh, and the last thing that's really cool is that these guys provide a marketplace. So if you design something that you can then sell it on Shapeways if you want to. And you can also get inspiration from the things that people sell. So you can get like super useful modifications to uh, like existing products that you use, like this uh, lens cap. Not so super useful modifications. <laughs> Foliage for your fixie. Um, you can get jewelry, like really cool, really weird, really beautiful jewelry. Um, there's a lot of like scientific or mathemological, math I don't think that's the word, mathematic uh, jewelry that's out there. You can get fine art. <laughs> that is 14 karat gold, $320. Uh, you can do game modifications, that's a really big thing, so now somebody might actually want to trade for your sheep. And of course, since this is the internet, you can get memes, like blue drunk shark, monkey selfie, cats, guns, fire breathing, laser unicorns, and rainbow, dogius, the doggy mobius strip, creepy horse head figurine, business cat, disapproval face coin, thorgy, potato Jesus, miracle potato chip, and many, many, many more. This was like a week straight of me just like blowing up our Slack channel, like, look at this thing. <laughs> So is it really as easy as it looks to go from this like little drawing to a 3D printed thing? And it totally is. So these are the results of my V1. I think it took maybe a week to draw out, um, mostly because I was taking my time and taking screenshots. And it took about two weeks to print. Um, so I got my V1, and immediately I found out some issues. Um, they're thin walls, and it's a little bit too shallow. So like when you feel it, it doesn't feel like a cookie cutter or a tool. Like it feels like, actually like when I brought it in, I was like opening the box, I was so excited, and my coworker was like, cool, you made like a thing. Is that like an earring? <laughs> so obviously V1, we gotta go for a V2, right? We gotta add some thickness, we wanna go for more length. So you can see with my lovely uh, model up here, I've got V1 and V2. V1 is in black, V2 is in white. So the first thing I changed, I used cheaper plastic. The quick left queue is normally black, but since I'm prototyping, I'm gonna go with a white, and you can rapidly ship that, and it's much cheaper than the black. Not much cheaper, but a little bit cheaper. I also went with thicker walls, and I added more depth. So now, like when I hold this thing, uh, it does feel like a cookie cutter now. But that actually points out a problem, which is that like, if I'm trying to mash that into dough, like I don't have anywhere to grip it that's really good. So V3, I added handles. 
So I should stop for a safety warning and let you guys know that most 3D printed plastics are not food safe. Um, also, my model probably licked them. <laughs> so <laughs> there are food safe print materials out there like ceramic for matching espresso cup. Uh, I did, ceramic takes longer to print though, so that's actually not ready for the talk. It took about a month. It's taken about a month. Uh, but what I did is just cover it in saran wrap before I actually used it with dough. And the results, I am... <laughs> yeah, I don't have any excuse. <laughs> so, but that's good, right? That's what we do, right? Uh, I did some market research. I brought out my MVP, nobody wants my mutant cookies, I did some rapid prototyping, time to pivot. I am not printing, I'm not printing cookie cutters anymore. So that is basically the end of my talk. Um, so I wanted to give you guys some resources before I go. If you are interested in doing 3D printing with SketchUp or at least playing with it, this book was I think maybe $13, 14 bucks on pack publishing by Marcus Ritland. It's from 2014, so it's relatively new. <coughs> It basically goes over everything you need to know just generally about 3D printing and then also specifically about SketchUp, so it's super useful. Um, and since SketchUp is a free program, it's, it's kind of cool. You can just try it out. Um, other resources, you can download SketchUp Make. Uh, there's the Ruby SketchUp APIs on the SketchUp site. Thingiverse is, I think, made by Maker, and then what it is is it's an upload place, um, like where the extension warehouse has models. This is specifically for 3D printing. They're almost all in STL, and people have like all of their models. So if there's anything you're looking to make, somebody's probably tried it and put it up there. Um, and then also Shapeways is the online printing service I would recommend. I used iMaterialize on Shapeways. iMaterialize is in Belgium. It takes a little bit longer, and it's a little bit more expensive. So um, if I was going to recommend one, I'd probably go with Shapeways just to try it out. I think iMaterialize might ultimately better, be better in the long run if you're, if you're going to make a business. I also uh, wanted to point out, Turing.io, um, this is School of Software and Design, a registered Colorado nonprofit. But this is actually, this was the difference between me using Ruby and not. So if you know anybody who was like me at their job who could have used a little bit more Ruby foo to get better, I would recommend Turing. So that's my talk. Thank you.